All right, good morning. Good morning. Let's open in prayer. Uh, Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the name of Jesus and the power of the blood and the power of the cross that has freed every one of us this day. Uh, Father, that day of salvation. And Father, you said we're working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And so, Father, I pray for that in all of us and in the churches this morning. Uh, Lord God, that you would bring forth your word in power and in might. And we thank you for the word. We uh, pray protection on folks that are on their way. Uh, Lord, with the snow and so on. And Father, just watch over and keep them. We thank you for this day. We bind the principalities and the powers of darkness that try to move against the word of God and try to steal the seeds of truth. And Father, we thank you this morning for the hedge of protection that's round about every one of us in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Okay, well, we waited a few minutes because up here in Northeast Ohio, it still snows every so often. And suddenly we've got two to three inches of snow uh, in the last hour or so. And I know the roads are slippery and so on, so we try to wait a little bit. Uh, we're a small group, but that's okay. Right, because if two or more are gathered in my name, uh, if any, any two of you agree as touching anything as the Bible says, uh, that's in line with his word and his way, his will, he said those things will come to pass. Amen? Amen. So we've all dealt with our heat issues. Isn't it funny? I just ministered about on Wednesday night about being cold. And yesterday, here we were, our church kind of was... Uh, in a freeze and everything was going on and guys rushed out here and got everything working and so uh, we're happy about that and happy to be able to gather because we uh, probably would have had to go somewhere else for ministry this morning but wherever we go it doesn't matter right Amen. the Lord is still with us Amen. so this morning I want to talk a little bit about a faith failure <clears throat> you probably know that scripture very well when Jesus talk to Peter. I want to give you a little understanding of it this morning. Maybe you'll see something you haven't seen before. We pray that the Lord would make himself known in some of these things. And with this, as far as where to actually start, but um, a couple of different issues here. Luke chapter 22, and you can start in around verse 22. <clears throat> and there's some things here that uh, we need to just sort of pull out of some of the scripture and understand what it says. But the key of what we're going to talk about is that Jesus said to Philip, or excuse me, to uh, Peter, that I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. In the situations we're all in this morning, and were this week and will be in the weeks to come, I want you to know that as we pray, like as we gather on Saturday mornings and we gather on Saturday nights and we pray for the saints and we pray for all of you, sometimes mention all of your names, sometimes mention other names and situations and so on, we're doing the very same thing that Jesus said he did for Peter. So let's just read through Luke 22 a little bit here, and uh, I'll pick out a couple things, and hopefully, as I said, you'll gain some understanding out of this. I guess I do want you to remember that when Jesus uh, had ministered and the disciples asked him, why do you speak in parables? You remember what he said was, their eyes will see, but they will not see, and they'll hear, but they will not understand it's given for you to know the things of the kingdom in a paraphrase and so for all of us you and I are to get things out of the scripture that other folks out there in the world that don't know Jesus read the scripture and they can't figure it out the very same thing is when uh, Jesus talked about eating my body and drinking my blood now, that sounds totally cannibalistic, but we who understand what he was teaching and instructing know he didn't mean that whatsoever, but we partake of his word, which is the bread from heaven, and the wine representing the oil 
uh, the Holy Spirit and the anointing and walking with the Lord, following him, obeying his commandments, that we're not literally eating his body and drinking his blood. He said, this do in remembrance of me. So we very specifically let people know these are the emblems that represent his body and his blood. But they are not literal. And so in the very same way, there are so many things through the scriptures here. Uh, I just think it's kind of amazing here. Let's go. Uh, Luke 22, verse 22. It says, truly the son of man goeth as it was determined. And for all of us, we should be praying that we go as it is determined before the Lord. Jesus meant one of these days, and he'll clarify this down a little further in the scripture, one of these days, I'm not going to be with you. And you're going to have to deal with these issues and these things. He said, Uh, The Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. Right? We know the scripture told us that Christ would be betrayed by one of his own. He called it in the scripture, my own familiar friend. And so we know that's there. And he says to his followers here that are, we would say as babes in the Lord, if they're walking with him, that one of these days what is written about me is going to have to come to pass. Church, we need to awake to the fact what the scripture says about the church, us as the people of God, one of these days it's going to come to pass that there's going to be persecutions. One of these days it's going to come to pass that good is going to be looked at totally as evil and horrible and disgusting and doesn't fit into the scale of what this new world order is bringing about. Why do we want to keep putting that off? We're just like these guys. We need Jesus to sit down and talk to us. And I don't mean that in the literal sense, but explain to us or message come across to us that one of these days, I got to stop telling myself that this could never happen. You know, we're looking at, what, a 12 to 14 percent uh, inflation hike. You could sit here and say, well, I'm not paying that for meat. Well, you won't be eating for very long Amen. because it's here. Do you understand? And this is some of what Jesus is saying to us in the scripture. Face the reality. It's written. It's coming to pass. I'm going to go as de- is determined in the scripture. And so if you hear evil spoken against the churches, listen, of course we've got to check uh, to make sure that the people aren't doing evil, but you shouldn't go at that with an evil intent or having already believed the lie, if it's a lie. It should be that we're the brethren, we check with each other, we cover each other in the sense uh, we don't cover sin, but we cover each other when there's wickedness and things being mounted against us. Right? Before we believe evil, we should believe, well, we know they're preaching the word, they're teaching the gospel, they maybe have gotten off in a little bit, that doesn't make them enemies of the church. So he said, the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto him, woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. So in reality... We may read scripture that says we're going to encounter these various things and men may do these things to us, but he's saying unless they repent, woe's going to be to them in what they do, in the wickedness they do. It tells us in Psalm 2 about the kings of the earth rising up against the Lord and against his anointed. Well, it tells us that's going to happen, but still there's going to be woe to them unless they repent of their sins. In verse 23, it says, And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. I kind of think this is a little funny because when you read the rest of it, where they go to, so they heard what Jesus said, that somebody is going to betray him, as is written in the scripture. So they're inquiring among themselves, well, which one of us is going to be the one that's the betrayer? But then they go right into um, 
And there was also strife among them, which one of them should be accounted the greatest. So they went from the pits of the low to which one of us is going to be the highest esteemed. Now that never happens with any of us. We are so well, you know, fundamentally, and since I said fundamentally, I think I'm going to start saying more often that we are heading toward a fundamentalist congregation, that we're sticking to the scripture. We're doing what the word says. Yes, we believe in being filled with the spirit. We do believe in praying in tongues, but that says decently and in order, which means we don't run down the streets and jump on the pews shouting out in our prayer language and things because the scripture totally bans all that kind of stuff. We're to do it in the depths of prayer, as the Bible says. And if there's tongues in interpretation, well, then there should be an interpretation with that and start getting back to what the Scripture says about these things because so many people are prophesying this and prophesying that, and it doesn't line up with Scripture. They're doing these things that are out here, and it doesn't line up with Scripture whatsoever. They're going by means that don't line up with Scripture. They're to line up with the word of God. This is our safety. This is our instruction book. This is our directives on how to operate in the church, how to function in the church, how to love one another, what real love is. How often I have said that the Bible says, um, speak the truth in love. Love doesn't lie to people. Love doesn't say you're okay, even though I know you're living in total sin. He said, speak the truth in love. I love you. I'm going to tell you the truth. I just had this happen with somebody. I said, you know, I didn't know when this chance would come about. But now that you asked the question, let me tell you. And I went through the truth, even though I know it wasn't going to be easily accepted. Now you have to deal with that. It's in the scripture. I gave you scripture, look it up for yourself. Now you make a choice. The truth in love. Not it's okay that you live the way you're living when I know it's total sin. Uh, Like I've said so many times, you may have people in the church that are living these alternate lifestyles or various ways or wherever you want to go. They may be in the church, but if the Bible says they won't make it into the kingdom, then you better deal with those issues in the church. Get them converted, get them changed. That's the truth in love. So that they can make it into the kingdom. So they may hurt now for a season. They may struggle through all kinds of battles because they now know the truth and they've got to choose to do the truth. But it's better than the struggle they're going to go through for eternity if they don't change. But you see, society today has watered the gospel down so much that everybody gets to go to heaven. Jesus never said that. He warned us about all these things. So they're arguing about who's going to betray him. And then after that, which one of us is going to be greater? And so sometimes you may never speak that or I may never speak it. But many times it's working in our heart. It's a work Like when we talk about faith without works is dead. It's a work that's going on there that shows us where we really are if we'll pay attention. That we need to get rid of. And he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. In other words, I'm the high and mighty. You're the people. You submit to me, he said. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. If you're a benefactor, what does that word sound like? You benefit from them being under you. They're your servants. And you know what? How much of this has infiltrated some of the church too? I'm the mighty man of God, and so you all have to do everything I say, even in some of these uh, religious factions, even if it doesn't go along with doctrine. I'm the man of God. You're like servants. That's never the case in the gospel. And Jesus says that right here. They that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But you shall not be so. 
But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. Now, in the room today, they're talking about uh, Joseph and the coat of many colors. And it came up that one of the questions is always asked, well, why did Joseph's father love him more than his brothers? And some of the theologians, I guess, or the Bible commentators go into how many bad parent examples there are in the scripture. But you can look at it that way, just like you can look at Moses murdered the Egyptian. You're familiar with that in the scripture? But he didn't really murder him. He defended his brother, right, is what the scripture says. You remember that I explained to you in, in the Hebrew language the word uh, killed his brother there and killed in another place. One at the other place represented murder, but where it was with Moses, it includes defense. There's a whole different scenario. If we don't look at it properly, we've got people telling folks, Moses was a murderer, but he wasn't. He was defending his people. If somebody came in here today with a gun and started shooting, and I pulled out uh, this rifle that I have up here, that I don't really have up here, and shot them, somebody could say the pastor murdered a guy in the church. But you'd know it was defense, right? Amen. Same thing. So it says here, he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. So anyway, Joseph, if you read the scripture, it says that his father favored him because he was his child of old age. And some of you can say that you, you, know, you had a child maybe later on in your years or in life, and the other ones were quite a bit older, so you did treat the younger one different all the time because you weren't dealing with the other three anymore. So now you had time to just focus on them. And it's sort of like the same thing here. But listen, if Moses didn't have that run-in with the Egyptian, would he have ever been out there in the wilderness where God spoke to him? If Joseph wasn't looked on by his father the way he was, and the brothers treat him the way he did, would he have ever gone to the caravan, to the pit, to Pharaoh's house? Would he have ever gone to those things? It's like we're always trying to find some uh, reasoning, like maybe to write another Dr. Spock book, I don't know what, but instead of seeing that, wait a minute, it may not have looked good, but look how God allowed it to fit in the plan. Remember, Rahab was there in Jericho, and she covered for the men of God, the spies. We read about uh, Hagar and Abraham and what went on. But in all of that, God allowed it to be used in the picture of what he's doing all the way along here. As Jesus said, him being betrayed as it was determined. And there's so many things in all these. We've got to see what's determined to the Lord. And you've made mistakes and I've made mistakes raising children. But you know what? If it worked to their good, my kids will tell you that they remember when we got almost nothing for them for Christmas. But later on in life, they're saying we're so glad because so many other people we know that we're getting everything. Look what's happened to them. I said that in case any of them are here or listening, they'll remember those words. I don't want them to forget. We had very humble beginnings and a humble lifestyle. Amen. But I didn't really come from that in a sense. I could have had all kinds of things. But the Lord moved on me to do some things, and I did, that maybe looked bad for a while, but the Lord later brought that all back. So he says about, let him be as the younger. So... Joseph was one of the very younger, yet the Lord raised him up because he was the one, remember, that took, his, took the lunch and various things. Well, that was David, excuse me. Uh, he, but he served with his other brothers. And it says, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that does serve. So whenever any of us starts to get an arrogant or haughty mentality about how long we've been in the Lord and, you know, how smart we are about the gospel, 
it means we should serve more and more. We should uh, be laboring among the congregation, among the people more and more because we now are servants of the Lord. So it says in verse 27, For whether is greater he that sits at meat or he that serveth? Is not he that sitteth at meat the greater one? And that's where Jesus should have been sitting. But he said, but I am among you as he that serveth. Jesus came and served people who were living in total sin against God and served people that should have known better and should have known who he was. But he was serving them. And he says, and that's how we're to be. He says, you, in verse 28, you are they which continued with me in my temptations. And I could say to a lot of you today, you stuck with me through a lot of the craziness that went on from when I first was put in here to do this and so on and other things that have gone on and just like this pandemic where we don't know really what to do at various times. Uh, then we have other things that occur and so on. If I had the ability to reward everybody, I'd be doing exactly what Jesus says here. Of course, I could have a dinner and say, all of you come, because that's what he's saying. I'm appointing to you a kingdom as my father appointed unto me. He says, you are they which continued with me in my temptations. Now, I could tell you I was tempted to walk away, but I really wasn't. I could tell you that I was tempted to go attack everybody, but I really wasn't. But Jesus is saying in the temptations he went through, which really represents the trials and some of the persecutions in a sense of folks coming against him that you stuck with me in that and hopefully that's not just a physical sticking with but on the inward it was listen i see what's happening here and you know a lot of times that's what we have to have happen and that's what peter later when he would tell jesus you know, you have the words of life. Where else will we go? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, flesh and blood has not made this known to you. You see, we're dealing with a lot of folks where they're still in the flesh and blood thing. And it, the same prime example is the communion, the flesh and blood. It's got to really be as flesh and blood. No, that's not it whatsoever. And so he said to Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. I hope you've had revelation of the Lord in some place in your life that, listen, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is who I'm supposed to be engaged with and so on. That you're not just here because you say, well, this was my seat for 45 years. Because there's no life in that whatsoever. And nor will you get involved in things down the road because... Either it's all about you and me, or it's just, well, I'm just here. Or you realize that God did this for us for a reason. And that's why we're still going on after all this time with so many attacks and so many battles and some things that we did totally wrong. But if there's repentance and crying out to God, like I said I, maybe last week, other churches should forgive because we forgive. And the Lord forgives. Isn't it terrible you get to heaven one day and you stand before the Lord and you just rail on whoever you're talking about? And the Lord says, well, you know what? They cried out to me many times about repentance and forgiveness. That was forgiven ages ago. And there you are. You wondered why when the angels tried to lift you up in the catching away it took them so long because you had that thing weighing you down and I know that's not doctrine don't anybody go out saying well if I'm holding this the angels are going to have a hard time picking me up but you get the picture don't you Amen. and that's what's important and I'm not starting a false doctrine or teaching I'm really trying to be very cautious about all that kind of stuff because I'm watching so many people say things and do things and be pacified where 
You mean we're not allowed to say this is wrong anymore? Wait, and you and I, we're all in the church? We're supposed to declare what's wrong Amen. and what's right. That's what the priesthood was all about. So you have continued with me in my temptations. In verse 29, he said, I appoint unto you a kingdom. Why do you and I need to endure to the end? Why do you and I need to continue in the faith? Grounded and settled, as it says in the word. Because he's appointed to us a kingdom. They may have a little different seat, a little different position. But he's appointed the same for us. That's what this is all about. That's why we endure. That's why we continue. That's why we go through things with people when they're being tempted, when they're being tried. When they're going through persecutions, I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me. Now we know Jesus is going to receive his kingdom because it was determined as we started in the very beginning that my son is going to have the kingdom, that the king, uh, king David and his heritage, his lineage, a king will sit on the throne forever because of the promise God made. You and I have a kingdom appointed to us. And Jesus says, us who continue in his temptations. What, when his name's bashed now, do you feel tempted like, you know what, Lord, this is, gosh, they're really getting terrible. Or when they want to shut down the churches, Lord, this is really bad. Uh, you know, when they broadcast in the news that we're banning these words and you're not allowed to say these things anymore. That's hate speech. All against Jesus. Although he's not physically here in body, but he's with us, right? Amen. And he dwells in our hearts, the Bible Amen. says, by faith. He walks with us. He walks in the midst of his churches, he said, in Revelation. He walks in the midst of the candlesticks. That's the church. The candle is the church. So you continued with me, I appoint unto you a kingdom because it's been determined to the Father. As my Father has appointed unto me, he determined that Christ is going to have a kingdom. The Bible tells us in the parable about the uh, man uh, who built the vine uh, vineyard and put a wall around about it, and put a tower in it, and put men in charge of it, and he went away to receive a kingdom. Because that's what's been determined. He said that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And we all talk about that, right? We're seated with Christ in heavenly places. We're not physically there right now. But there's a place prepared for us. In my father's house, he said. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. His kingdom. And sit on thrones. They say this is reserved for those 12 disciples because they represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to sift you, that he may, or to have you, excuse me, that he may sift you as wheat. What do you notice there? Do you remember that Jesus had changed Simon's name, called him a piece of the rock, Peter, Petra, the rock. But for some reason, Jesus refers to him by the name that he was called before. Now the Bible tells us that he will give every one of us a new name. So for him to refer to us in heaven, if this was possible, by the old name might represent that we'd gone back to those old things. Because you and I have become new creations in Christ, right? Amen. You have a new heart, the Bible says, if you're one of his. He's renewing your mind through the reading of the word. And he says, I'll give you a new spirit. And so we become new people in Jesus. That means my old personality and my old weak things 
should be left back there somewhere. I should be walking in the newness of life, he said, as being raised with Christ from the waters of baptism, all those things. But he calls him Simon, Simon. It's Jesus prophetically letting us know that Simon is going to dissipate in his walk, go back to some of the fears he had before, uh, not stick with Jesus like we know he says he will. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. Now, if I say to you, what's your greatest desire? You think the sun shining and the flowers coming up would be so beautiful. I just desire that. Why, I desire to be at the beach in Florida, Myrtle Beach, San Francisco, or wherever the beaches are. And I just desire to lay on the sand, and right? I mean, that's what you all would consider a desire. But the word desire here doesn't mean any of that. Because Satan's not like that. It says in the, in the Greek that Satan demands to have you. And when it says you here, the term you is plural. He's not just talking to Peter, although he's addressing Peter. He's saying Satan demands to have all 12 of you. But then he says that he may sift you as wheat. That means, in our terms, we would say run you through the ringer, put you through the gauntlet, uh, beat you to a pulp, is what it says in our modern day terminologies. Beat the tar out of you. We won't go any further than that. He desires, he demands to have you. Think about this. Satan is demanding of the Lord to have Peter, who he's calling Simon at this point, and the other 11 disciples. Although we know one is going to be had because he's actually going to get him down the road and enter into him, as the scripture says. Amen. But he says, but I have prayed for thee. And I want to say again, there are some of us that are always praying for all of you and everybody else that we don't see sometimes and other people that we encounter that we know are believers and are being sifted and put through the ringer and somewhat being beat to a pulp in some of the things that are going on in their lives because every one of us comes to these kind of places. When we have trouble in our lives, the devil uses that to demand to get to us. How many of you remember, this goes back months ago, I talked about when the Bible says about uh, when the Lord said that he will not allow us to come to any temptation that's too great for us. It means he dealt with those temptations before they got to us. He dealt with the enemy before he got to put that heavy thing out there in front of us because we may not have handled that one. That's the blessing of all of this. That kind of takes away your haughtiness and your arrogance and your bold statements because without him, he said, we can do nothing. It's all in him that we overcome this. Jesus ever lives to make intercession on our behalf. You say, well, why am I still at least listening a little bit? Because I'm really not walking with the Lord. That's what we've been praying about. Getting caught up in all these things out here in the world and saying this is more important. That's what we've been praying about. If you can hear any of this, you need to realize, listen, there were a lot of people that saw Jesus in the flesh. There were a lot of people that listened to the message. There were a lot of people that never, ever followed him anywhere. And they are not his. But those who followed him, endured with him in his temptations, look what he says about them. 
And if you're believing this false doctrine that you get to go to heaven because you said his name, you're in total error. I know there's not a lot of folks here, but hopefully folks are out there listening. Amen. Because this is the gospel. Amen. If he doesn't know our name in the end, how's he going to know our name? Because one day I raised my hand in the church and said, I do. How would your wife know you or your husband know you if that's all you ever did one day was said, I do at the altar. And then you went about your lifestyle the way you were before. And she's sitting home saying, where is he? Where is he? What's he doing? I don't even know the guy. And how many of you know that most of you got to really know your husband and wife after you married him? Amen. Because they never showed you that they had an artificial foot until one day you went to put their slippers on for him. You know that old uh, thing, uh, what's his name, the singer did where... His wife took out her teeth and then she popped out her eye and he didn't know what he married. It's a Christian group. Anyway, you think about that. You raised your hand at the altar, said, I do. You got in your car and drove away and she never saw you again or he never saw you again like runaway bride. At least she stopped before she said, I do in the movie. But in that, think about what I'm saying. And listen, if you think I don't say, Lord, I want to know that I'm going to make it. Amen. And I've taken some licks for that from some people who said, well, I know for sure I'm making it. Do you really? Did Peter know what was laid out before him, what he was going to encounter? The fear that was going to grip him, where he would stand at a distance? This, this, is this why Jesus referred to him as Simon and not Peter? Hey, it's like when you say to somebody, man, I remember when you were faithful. I remember when you were one of the prayer warriors. I remember when you were strong. All of those wordings are in there with that Simon. Simon, you said to me that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. I said to you, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Where are we going to go? You have the words of life. I mean, how many of you, if you could just say to people, do you remember some of the great things that happened in your life because you were in the Lord, because Amen. you were in church, Amen. because you were in prayer, some of the things you said at some point in time, how it shook you up or stirred you or gave you hope. And now we're too busy for that. Now we're letting this thing uh, People say you got to wear a mask, you got to get a shot, you can't come around unless you have or you haven't or this or that. And we're letting that dictate to us about what we do. And I know it doesn't mean we don't use wisdom and some things you want to minimize or whatever the case because this is real and it's really hurting people and doing things. But how many of you remember? I remember we got some snow today and I know we're older than we were before, but I can remember... Uh, 15 years ago, there was a major snowstorm, and we were here having church. And a guy came in and said, you know what? Where I go to church was canceled. I went to a couple other churches, and finally I said, you know what? Those people will be at church. And here we were, because we were committed to what we were doing. Amen. We were taught to keep a commitment. We were taught to be faithful about what we do and say. I'll say over and over again, yeah, there may have been some things wrong, and I've said this to many people. You might be right, but you can't deny the teaching. You can't deny the power of God that worked in a lot of our lives that kept us where, like I say so many times, I don't understand how I changed like that. And I don't understand to this day. But I want to see that happen in people's lives to where they're not here one week saying, I love Jesus, and then they're in the slosh pit and live in that way. And you've got people that won't set foot in here because I told them they needed to repent. That's not my words. Amen. Did I need to break out my Bible and read it out of the book of Acts or read it where Jesus said, 
uh, least you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Would that make it okay? And then you'd come to church? Listen, you can go to any other church just like anybody could come here and hide in their sins, but you're not going to hide it from God. Amen. And you're not going to get one day and say, well, I demand you let me in. And he's got to open the door. I'm sure people out there swimming in the water said, Noah, open the door, open the door. Noah couldn't open the door because God sealed it. Amen. When God shuts this door for the last time, you can call your parents and if their cell phone, their Tesla phone that we talked about if you weren't here, is supposed to work on the moon or Mars or everywhere else, so you can call your relatives there. Even so, they're not going to open the door. Because when he has shut the door, unless he knows your name, you can't get in. Amen. Unless Tesla comes up with something else like a pry bar <laughs> that opens any door wherever it's at. But you know that ain't going to work either. Right? You remember me talking about the Tesla phone? This is how far in advance it is that they expect they'll be able to talk to people in space and on the planets or whatever. And then they want to put the chip in your head so you won't need to carry the phone and you'll still, you'll be able to communicate with aliens. And I said, well, don't you understand? Some people are already doing that now without the Tesla phone. You talk to them for a while, you go, wow, they're out in space somewhere. It's getting warm in here. It is. It is. All right. Well, uh, listen, he said, Satan has desired to have you. Satan is demanding every one of you. There is not a person I know people will say, oh, he'll never get me. I remember a guy who we were on an Israel trip and he put his coat on his shoulders and he was prancing around and I love Israel and I love God and I'm committed and we haven't seen him for years. And nor has he ever gone back there. But in a moment, in a time, we could have reverted back to calling him Simon, Simon. You made a lot of great statements, said all kinds of things. What's the Bible say? You better pay your vows to the Lord. Well, that means if you haven't kept what you said, you owe a pretty big debt. Amen. And I don't mean just financially. Peter said, I'll stick with you through thick and thin. He said, through prison and through death. And what happened? He saw them both. But because of what Christ did for him, the prayer he prayed for him, uh, going against the powers of darkness, he ended up going through both of those things and never denying the Lord again. Amen? Satan has demanded to have all of you because he referred to you in the plural in the Greek. And then he says that he may sift you as wheat. And it says in 32, but I have prayed for thee. Now in a lot of the versions it says I have prayed for you. And the you in that version is singular, which means you, Peter. Because even though the devil demanded every one of them, you're the one that's going to go through the hardest battle. You're the one that the Father revealed this to. So he has great things in store for you. So the de devil wants to do you worse than everybody else. Because you're the one that kept some of these men together, maybe. Whatever the case, your declaration of who I am, your declaration of where will we go. Isn't it funny today people can go almost anywhere? It's not about the word of life. It's about how I fit. How this little thing is and that little thing is. Remember some of the churches, they fought over what color the carpet was? Look at us. We haven't had to fight over any of that. We haven't done any of it for years. But it's still comfortable. It's still fine. It may not be up to snuff as far as people who we've had some folks come in here and say, oh, you have pews. I won't come to church here. Oh, really? It's not about the word of life. It's about what I desire, what I decide. 
I have prayed for thee. We've been praying and praying and we're going to keep praying and keep believing and keep battling the principalities and the powers of darkness. Listen, a lot of people ought to be thanking God that there's some real people that pray. That there's some real people that feel the burden and the weight. You know, a lot of this, you can go, well, hey, I'm the pastor of the church. I don't have to let any of that bother me. I was out talking to some folks and I thought about, you know what? I've invited lots of people to come and share at the mall with us when we're out there sharing the gospel. I love doing that. I don't know what makes me different than anybody else. And I don't feel like it's a shame that as the pastor, I go up to strangers and share the gospel with them. But I can tell you, and you won't know where this is, I won't be definitive. We were somewhere as a group and some things were going on on the street and there were some street preachers. And somebody said to me, why do they have to be out here doing that? And I said, well, listen, you may not understand this, but that may be the only gospel they'll they'll ever hear. And then I refrained from burying them with, how many people have you shared the gospel with? How many people have you put yourself in a place where you would be an embarrassment to society because you are mentioning the name of Jesus, telling them they got to be born again. And there was nothing repulsive about what they were doing. I shared with all of you here when I went down to the, uh, what was it called, the Pride Day, I think it is, down here at the park, and went out there and talked to people. I don't care if they don't like me when it's all over and done. That's not what this is about. If you hate me in the end and fought me all the way along and you made it into heaven because I confronted you with stuff, that's what it's all about. Amen. Amen. But do you really think that way? Does the church really think that way? Well, we want to be known in high esteem in the community. Well, if they're going to hell, what's the difference what the community thought of you? It doesn't make a difference whatsoever. He didn't put us here to look good in the community. He put us here to be the salt and the light, to speak the truth in love, to confront wickedness and evil, to be as the priest who uh, defines between clean and unclean, holy and unholy. We're scared to even do that in the church now, let alone in the community. I prayed for you that your faith fell not. I know you may say I get tired of hearing it. Well, why don't you get on the side of being the ones praying with us then? Amen. We're in worse straits as a nation than we've seen in our lifetimes. But how many people go to prayer and call out to God and join in, in one fellowship as we are to be in one voice, in one accord? as it was in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came. Some people can't even keep function for, or focus for this little bit of time in church. Everything drawing you away. For what? You're talking about spending eternity. And if you can't see that, you need the Father to reveal it to you just like he did to Peter. I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, Listen, everybody, people's faith is failing left and right. People's faith is letting down all over the place. Well, I believed in Jesus and I believed he was coming, but now it looks like everything's getting better. Well, who gave you that story? That comes right from the abyss of hell. It's not getting better, it's getting worse. You listen to our president say the economy's better. And it could be the last president, too. I don't care which party it is, who it is, what the media is saying. Are you noticing the price increases? You didn't get a 17% raise since the beginning of the year. Social Security, people were saying, hey, we got a raise. Yeah, well, they took that all back plus two times more. Oh, you like that part, huh? (laughs) 
That's because you're on Social Security. I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. What's your faith causing you to do? James chapter 2 tells us that faith without works is nothing. Amen. Am I preaching more? Am I ministering more? Am I witnessing more? Am I getting out more? Am I doing things, getting people like, hey, listen, am I doing that more? Somebody said, you know what? I don't want that kind of stuff on my Facebook page. I've been saying to all of you for years now, two and a half, three years, listen, you post all this stuff. Why can't you read a scripture into your phone and post it out there? And maybe somebody you've never, ever seen is going to be reached with that. Amen. Take you two minutes. Or share what we're doing. I've asked that so many times. I see everybody's stuff. Who shares it tells you on there. Who shares the message. It's very easy to see. Not that you really want to. Are we ashamed of Jesus? Are we ashamed of his gospel? Or are we committed to the Lord? I'd rather be known as a fanatic for Jesus. Oh, wait, let me... I'd rather be known as a fundamentalist for Jesus Amen. than known as, well, he's a nice guy. I go in coffee shops, talk to guys, have coffee with them, and so on. If that's all they ever know of me, shame on me if I've never even talked to them about the gospel. Amen. And then you find out, like I've said so many times, I meet somebody and I don't say a word about who I am and they let you know that they already know who you are? Well, that tells you people talk, and they converse. And you may try to move in secret, but in reality, something about what you do is what is noised abroad. That's why I said one day in here, this was last year, I said, listen, go on my Facebook page, you'll see one or two things compared to 10 or 15 things that are all gospel, scripture, me putting this out, because this going out is more important than my daughter's business or my, you know, this or that or this nice looking thing they did over here in the city or the county or whatever the case. It's far more important. Down a little ways here, Jesus tells us in the scripture, either this one or the next one that we're going to read, that the word that I speak to you, it is spirit and it is life. What did he say? Oh, it is in the other scripture, I'm pretty sure. Uh, when they were ashamed that he had embarrassed the Pharisees in what he said. And when they walked away, he said, well, are you going to leave me also? Listen, you all saw a lot of people walk away here. Amen. That's why I said you stuck with me through this, hopefully for right reasons. Not because I'm known for being here or I don't have any other place to go, or they give me money, or I got a house, or whatever the case be in any scenario whatsoever, or it's close to me and not a far drive. I hope it's because it is the word. Amen. Hope it is because you've seen some things happen in your own families that you know God blessed you and moved when it was totally against everything you saw. He said, I prayed for you that your faith not fail. When somebody passed away that we didn't expect, our faith could fail. When we get under a hardship, when we get to this place, one day they call you up on the phone and say, listen, we're from the bank. Uh, your account is no longer valid, and the money in there has no value whatsoever. Our faith could fail. What do I do from here? You may say, well, that would never happen. Well, tell that to the Venezuelans. Tell it to some of these people where, was it Brazil, the 144% increase of inflation or whatever it was back in the days where all of a sudden everything went wild. What they had was worth nothing. The Bible says the day will come when it'll take a wheelbarrow full of money for a loaf of bread. Good thing about that is by then most of us won't want to eat bread because we know it's not good for us anyway. But it's referring to literal good bread. 
Of course, if you talk about buying organic food or whole grain things that are natural organic, they cost five, six times what you're paying for bread in the store because it's real stuff. Okay. So I prayed for thee, Jesus said, that thy faith fail not. He's there praying for us now. I may be able to do this because of that. You may be standing the way you're standing because of that. Because our prayers, if we're listening to the Spirit of the Lord and praying uh, the will of God for the saints, like it says in the Scripture, that means we're praying what He's praying. We're desiring what He's desiring for your life, for who you are. Listen, every one of us is going to give an account like we talked about Wednesday night. He talks about the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to answer for what we did with our salvation. Amen. Who we influenced, who we took the word to, what we labored in, what we worked in, what we sacrificed so that we could do those things. Listen, if you're living a life today where you don't sacrifice anything for nothing for the Lord, what are you doing? I have a lot of days I get a phone call, everything changes. I run into somebody, everything changes. Somebody sends a message, hey, this is happening for somebody. They need help, everything changes. I'm so glad to be able to just do that. And you may say, well, if you had a business or something, you couldn't do that. And that may be possibly true. And I was in that position and I never faulted anybody since then because I was in that and understood it. But I also knew that if I could have sold that thing and got out from under it, which we tried to do and never went anywhere, tried to put people in to run it, never went anywhere, I felt like I was in a prison and God let me be there. Not knowing why, but I'm sure Joseph felt that way in the pit. I'm sure Daniel felt that way in the lion's den. I'm sure those three Jewish kids thought the same thing in the fiery furnace. I don't think they wanted to be there. And I didn't want to be there. But I said I'm going to make the best of where I am. Amen. And I think today I can tell you that that's why with some of the things of the ministry, I function the way I do. Because I wasn't like that before. And so Joseph did some things when he came out of the pit under Pharaoh's... Uh, supremacy there that he had never done that we saw before you think about where some of these things come from if those things hadn't happened if joseph wasn't the favorite son and the brothers weren't against him and didn't like him and so on and gee wasn't there a guy in the bible that had some dreams and visions about his brothers serving him Amen. who was that who joseph. yeah it was the same joseph why did those things happen? He didn't do what Mary did. Mary pondered those things in her heart. He actually spoke them. They hated him for what he spoke. But what he spoke was what God showed him. Okay, let me, let me, uh, I see what time it is and I don't want to, especially with the snow that's still coming down very hard, I want you to be able to get out of here. Let me think where I want to go since I said that about Joseph. I got a whole bunch more stuff here and I got a whole lot more scriptures. Uh, well, let's do this. Let's just jump over to John chapter 6. This is what I mentioned about, we talked about Jesus saying about the my body, my blood in 648 on down through about 57 or so, 58, uh, 59. It says in verse 59, These things said he in the synagogue about the blood and the body, as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, disciples, followers of his, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. When I talk about things like I just try to break it down a little easier because I was in a position stuck in a business it seems to be a hard saying when you say, well, we should do more for Jesus or we should plan our day, you know, as bringing the Lord a reward on what he's done in all of our lives. 
and not just being by the wayside. And listen, so many people would love to hear the guy up front say, you all start preaching and teaching and getting on your Facebook and putting scripture out there and this and that, because right now they feel like they got to have this great supreme calling from God. Hey, if you're faithful in the little things, you'll be faithful in much. If you're not even faithful in the little things, God's not going to give you your own. He's not going to do those kind of things. We were talking last night as we were getting ready to pray about somebody who asked me to ordain them. Some of the men here would remember this. And I said, well, listen, I'm not going to ordain you, but you go out and do what you told me you feel God called you to do and come back and bring me a report of what goes on. And then we'll talk about an ordination. Amen. You know what happened? Yes. Nothing. Then you weren't really called to that. Amen. That was an imagination of your mind because, listen, uh, and somebody said this to me out in Arizona. If you're called... You can take away the pulpit. You can take away the microphone, the camera. You can take away all the people. You're going to still do what you're called to do. Amen. No matter where you're at. Amen. Because if God has put you in that and you're obedient, you're going to fulfill what he said. If you're not called, well, I can't, I can't do this without a pulpit. I used to say to a lot of the people, you guys, you know what? If you got to have a church setting to do what you want to do, come on. If it's in you, it's in you. Amen. When Jesus talked about, remember, he cried out, it says in John chapter 7, at the last day of that feast, that word cried out means the same thing we read about back there with the Mount of Ebal, when God said with a loud voice, tell the people about the curses. As they're coming into the land, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and said, if anybody thirsts, let him come to me. Amen. And then he talked about the rivers of living water that will flow out of your belly. Listen, if there's living water flowing out of your belly, doesn't matter where you're at or what you're doing. Nobody's going to be able to stop it. Amen. He said so. But you've got to open the well. He's not going to force it open. Does that make sense? Amen. Yes, it does. If you don't have a paper that says I'm ordained because I can't find mine. I don't know. I haven't seen it for 15 years. I don't know. Does it sound like I'm a novice up here trying to do something I shouldn't be doing? Or you could say or somebody could say, well, my pastor's so much sweeter well, if that's his personality and character and he's actually building you up in the faith and everything else, that's fine. Amen. But you know what? We don't get to heaven by intellect. Amen. And there's a lot of people can quote far more scripture, take you through the historical things so much better, but it's not causing you to get off your backside and do something with the gospel, Amen. with what he's given us. Remember, he gave us the keys to the kingdom. It's like your parents give you a car and they give you these keys and you look at the car and you go to your room and you go to sleep and you get up in the morning and you go out there and sit in the car and you look at the car and you polish it a little bit and you go back in the house or the bus picks you up and you go to school. Your friends pick you up afterwards and take you places. Nine, ten months go by and your parents say, well, we gave you the keys to the car. What are you doing? Well, I guess I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know if I should do anything with it. I gave you the keys because once you put the key in, it starts and drives. You could be taking your friends. You could be driving to school. You could be going and get the groceries. Well, I, I didn't want to use the key. That's what he gave them to us for. Okay. Luke, or John, I'm sorry, John chapter 6 we're in, right? And I'll finish here in just five minutes or so. So he administered about, in this portion of the scripture, in the synagogue, 
in Capernaum. We've all been to Capernaum many times. Uh, many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard that ministered about the body and the blood, they said, this is a hard saying, and who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that the disciples murmured at it, and listen, I would pray for pastors and people in ministry that as the Lord will allow, you can understand that there's people in the places around you that may murmur against what you preach. Amen. Now, if you're preaching a message where it kind of is always comforting them and so on, that's probably not going to happen. But if you start putting any, as the Bible says, we talked about Wednesday night, requirements, he has shown thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee. Amen. You start talking about that stuff, don't worry. Don't let doubt enter in. They're murmuring. That's what makes them murmur. Or when they come to you with their great thing and you say no, they'll murmur. Don't want you to have doubt. Jesus said we're not to be of a doubtful mind. It will happen. So his disciples murmured at it. He said unto them, does this offend you? You could say, in everything we do, did it offend you? Well, I don't think they... Did it offend you? Were you bothered by it? Were you ready to turn and walk away because of it? Look at what it says here. Does this offend you? Look what Jesus said. Because what he says here is why I say, do you remember some of the miraculous things that happened in people's lives? Do you remember the dramatic turnaround? Do you remember some that we knew should have passed but didn't? Do you remember that stuff? Yes, some passed and we have no, you know, they're with the Lord. Look what Jesus said. What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up to where he was before. Does this offend you? Does the fact that the pastor, the preacher, or whoever it is, said something in a hard way, and it offended you, do you realize that in the near future, that man may be influential in your making it into heaven because he continued? Are you aware that those words may have offended some people? Maybe you brought to church. They didn't like what was said. And I say to you, well, listen, uh, if you who has a limp leg, God heals you right here on the spot. Will you believe? And all of a sudden your leg is totally healed. Yes, we believe in healings. We believe God still heals. Amen. Just like he did in the scriptures. So Jesus said, what and if. You see the Son of Man ascend up to where he was before. So now we're out there in the book of Acts, chapter 1. We're standing there on the, the mound, and all of a sudden, Jesus is lifted up. And the angels say, what are you so amazed about? He's gone back to where he came from. That's all paraphrased. And you say, Boy, I was offended that he talked about that body and blood stuff. You think you're going to think about that? No. Hopefully not. Hopefully that's not the thing that makes you so heavy the angels can't pick you up. Like we talked about earlier. Amen. He said, what and if you see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Did they see that? They saw it. What was he telling them? Just like he said, Simon, Simon, Satan's going to put you through this, but I prayed for you. Hey, guys, you, you're offended. Are you offended at that? What if you're there when you see me ascend to the Father, which nobody has seen before? We talk about Elijah. That's different. Yes. So on and so forth. Enoch, who all of a sudden wasn't. Because the Lord took him. But you men that are offended right now and murmuring among yourselves, you're going to see me ascend 
to where I was before. Will that settle your issue? Will that calm you down? Will that cause you to say, gosh, I was offended by that. And look at where I am now. Amen. Let alone you've appointed to us a kingdom. Let alone you've given us the keys to the kingdom. Let alone back there, like you said in chapter 10 of what uh, Matthew or Luke, one of the two where you sent us out and sent the others out and they came back and said, even the devils are subjected to us. Listen, everybody, don't forget when you use the name of Jesus Christ in the authority that he's given us, those devils will go. They will back off. They will run in terror. Remember how mad those businessmen were when Jesus let the devils go into the pigs because they said, give us a place to go. You know, they hated Jesus because he ruined his business, not because he delivered the man. The delivering of the man wasn't as important to them as their money, as their financial future. Amen. Here's a man that was a total demoniac, scared every one of you. You couldn't even keep him bound in chains and fetters, the Bible says. Suddenly, he's in his right mind and clothed. In other words, he's not starting a nudist colony. He's put on clothing now where he ran around naked before and dwelled in the caverns. And you're upset by that. Just like a lot of church folks, when church went five minutes longer, well, the pastor could have prayed with them afterwards instead of making us all sit through that while they accepted Jesus. No, that's just the greatest miracle Amen. that there is. Somebody passed from death to life, Amen. out from under the power of Satan to the power of God. Now glory awaits them before the Bible says that the devil hell has enlarged itself back there in Isaiah waiting to suck them in amen? amen does it offend you what and if you see the son of man ascend to where he was before it is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh you getting out on time profits nothing Hearing a little bit of the spirit, of course, if you're all listening with a carnal mind, your spirit's not being fed anyway. You think you've already got it all. And I don't necessarily mean you like you as people. Let's use you as you plural, not you as you singular. You as all a use. <clears throat> it's the spirit that quickeneth the flesh, profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, Jesus is saying this, they are spirit. They are life. Now, if I'm talking to you about the, the snow out there and, you know, we're going to build a snowman after church or the football game and the Browns and the Bengals and, oh, the Bengals won. Oh, I'm so excited. Uh, there's nothing spiritual about any of that, nothing that feeds you. When Jesus said at that last day of the feast back there in John 7, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Do you know how many times your body is really thirsty, but you plugged it with iced tea or, you know, some ginger ale or some punch or, you know, sodas, and you haven't really quenched your thirst. You just satisfied your gut and whatever else is in there working. But you can be dehydrated drinking 25 cups of coffee a day or tea, or punch, or sodas, and so on. Amen. Jesus is talking about rivers of living water. Amen. You can plug yourself all up with all kinds of head knowledge that was called Gnosticism, which is still in total existence and promulgating itself right now. Or you can have the word of life. He said, that which I speak to you is spirit, and they are life, but some of you, there are some of you that believe not. And when you watch somebody in church and they can't get wait, wait to get out because of the game or because of dinner, they aren't really believing any of this. Oh, they say like it says in James, I believe there's one God. Do you know you don't go to heaven because you believe that? 
Because the next verse says even the devils believe it. Amen. The devils know it. The devils actually know the one that they're following and serving is not God. They already know it because they've been where God was. Therefore I said unto you, in verse 65, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. What did he say? I'm not worried that it was offensive. Are you offended? If you see me ascend to heaven, will you get over it? But the other disciples walked away and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will you go away? Jesus had said before, You stuck with me through the temptations. Here he's saying to him, Will you go away? Then Simon Peter answered and said unto him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Do you know, if you and I will lock in on the fact that these are the words of eternal life, we don't need to go anywhere else. We don't need to be drawn away. We don't need to have some great other thing or some emotional experience. These are the words of life. How is it that I can be a little bit blown out about something or stressed or not know what to do and sit down and read these words and all of a sudden I'm totally calm, totally at peace? It's because it's the word of life. Amen? Amen. Disciples said in Matthew 19.25, Who then can be saved? Because they heard some hard sayings. In Mark 10.26, they were astonished out of measure and said, who then can be saved? In Luke 18, 26, they heard what he said and said, who then can be saved? Three times, five words in the gospel. And why is that? When they heard this, they were sorrowful. Remember, it was about the rich young ruler, the rich the word rich doesn't just mean financial, it means abundance. It means you may have an abundance of friends. You may have an abundance of power. You may have an abundance of money, an abundance of family. And for any one of them, when Jesus gets down to that place and says, will you give that up to follow me, along with you saying that I keep the commandments, will that make you sorrowful? Because who then can be saved? Who then can be saved? Who then can be saved? Amen. I'll stop right there. Well, let me just finish that little bit. It says that Jesus said, How heartily shall they that have abundance of friends, abundance of power, abundance of money, abundance of fame, any of those things, how shall they heartily enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a man with abundance of any of those things to enter into the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. This morning, I'll just say, if you're out there listening, I know most of us here are born again for sure and believers, but if you're out there listening... The Bible says you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's not about who you know in the world. It's not about what denomination you may be in, what church you may go to, what religious training you have. The Bible says you must be born again. To do that, to be born again, is like being born into a new family, which is the family of God. It means that you must repent of your sins. So you need to know what sin is. The Bible's very clear about a lot of these things. You repent of your sins, believe on the Lord Jesus. He said all that believe on him will be saved. But in believing in him, there's a course of things that he requires of us to do so that we can make sure that our salvation is set in place, that our calling into the kingdom as God is drawing you. If you're listening today, it tells me God's either in your life or he's working on bringing you in. He's drawing you in. And you should think 
if the Lord God Almighty is actually drawing me into his kingdom, I'm very blessed. Amen. And you to give your life to the Lord this morning or any point along the way here, you'll find that God will do a great thing for you. So you need to repent of your sins. You need to let him be Lord of your life, which means you obey what it says in this Bible. And you need to get in a good Bible preaching church, uh, some of the fundamentalist church, Baptist church, gospel church like we are, wherever you can get to and get to know this Bible. And in that, you're going to know Jesus. Amen. So may the Lord bless you and uh, again, I just pray that you follow up with those things. And if you've never made that kind of a commitment, but you're in a church, make that commitment now. Give your life to Christ. Amen.